mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have faith so as, so as to remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. If I give it all away, give all away I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own ways. It is not irritable or resentful. It, is not in, it does not rejoice in, at wrongdoings, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and love never ends. Yesterday, Sean and I went to a beautiful, beautiful wedding where love was united. A couple was united together and made one. And that's what God wants with us. We are his bride. Once we are accepted into his kingdom, we are his bride. And we have to remember that we are unified with him. His love chases us. His love knows no bounds. His love is overwhelming and never ends. So let's worship him this morning. The king of kings who loves each and every one of you. He is so good. And we don't deserve the love. But he still loves us.
So through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. And through it all, through it all, it is well. Let's fix our eyes on him. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. And it is well. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord for this life that we live because of Him. Amen. The life we now live is through Him. And He is faithful to us. He is good to us can turn me down just a little better than we deserve amen? amen and jesus taught us the the importance of giving uh there's many ways to give we know that we're going to receive our offerings this morning uh, a, a way to give is financially but we can give life you can share life with people what he's given you what jesus has given to you and shared with you you can share that with others and that's 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 our job as christians share the love of Jesus. But we can share financially uh, also in different areas, different areas of ministry. And this morning our our offering is for uh, missions. Amen? That's good. Local missions. We have homes all around us. We have people and situations and circumstances that need help. And from time to time we're able to help them. We're able to share. But we also have other missions. Peru missions that we're tied with and Columbia and and I pray that you're a regular giver in those areas if you're not pray about that Uh, there's some promises to that when you give and you need to go in there and read your Bible and circle those promises and claim them claim them over your life not only in that area but other areas that Jesus speaks about circle that promise and claim that for you and for your household for your family he says when you give it'll be given back to you and not only that but it'll it'll come back in a good measure if we if we give gener- generously then generosity comes back to you so we are thankful this morning to be able to give that, that we can receive a nice good offering for missions amen Uh, Father, we thank you this morning for your kindness, your goodness toward us. Uh, God, you're so good, you're so faithful, and we thank you this morning, God, that uh, we are receiving tithes and offerings and alms and offerings for missions today, for uh, Peru, for the work there, the kingdom work that is going on, Uh, God, to help these churches, these pastors, uh, as they uh, preach the gospel, as they share, they teach. And also in Colombia, God, that, that ministry there, that it will not only be uh, giving of clothing and food, but it will be sharing Jesus with all of those that they come in contact with. And same here for us locally, God. We don't want to just sit idle on a seat and come in and, and, and just fill ourselves, but God, we want to leave this place each and every time that after we gather together that we share with others we share with our neighbor uh, about the love of Jesus and what it can do to your life the peaceful joyful life that you can live because of our Lord and Savior Jesus and we give you the thanks God in Jesus name amen Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Isn't the Lord good? Amen. Yes. 
I would like to have, before we go any further, we got a few things we're going to do this morning. Um, we, one of the good things that we're going to do is we're going to receive some new members in the church. Yes. But, bef but before we do that, Sister Lena, could you come, please? She's going to be going home, back to, Col uh, to Columbia. And so um, we want to pray for her. This is one of the missions that we support. She leads that. And uh, we want to we want to pray for her today that the Holy Spirit would just um, give her a fresh uh, anointing, a fresh touch, um, strengthening her body, uh, healing throughout her body, and uh, just go back in a new, fresh way. Amen. Amen. And so I'd like for us all to stand. Father, we just give you praise and glory and honor and thanks. We give you all the glory, God, for what you do. We thank you for Sister Lena, Lord. We thank you for the work that she's doing there among the children, among the place, cities that are there, God. And, Lord, we thank you because of the power of your Holy Spirit. And, God, we just pray healing over her body. We pray in the name of Jesus that you would strengthen her. God, that you would touch her, that you would anoint her afresh with a fresh outpouring so that the Holy Spirit just flows out of her like a river of living water as she goes forward, God. In the name of Jesus, doing the works, God, that you have called us to do. Healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out demons, seeing those around baptized in the Holy Spirit. And God, we thank you for the power of what you're doing in that place and in this life. God, I, I pray in Jesus' name. Father, do a mighty work there in his last day. Amen. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I'd like for all those who have gone through the Bethesda informational class and who have talked to us about um, being a member of Bethesda to please come forward. Yeah, you got it. That's that was really good, Katie. Trying to keep it so it, I don't tilt. Now, one of the awesome things that you notice here, not that we're against the, uh, you know, those that are older, but one of the awesome things that you see here is you see a, a younger group coming up. Amen. That, that if Jesus tarries one day, they will be the apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers around Bethesda. And, and when you look at every one of these people here, they all do things and help out in the church. Amen? Yeah. Aren't you thankful for that? Yeah. And just so you know that each one of these that are up here that's under 18 years old had to get their pa uh, parents' permission <laughs> to be up here this morning. And any parent that didn't give their kid permission to be up here this morning, I'm going to personally run you over with a vehicle. <laughs> Because I tell you what, membership is important. Yes, it is. Yes. Now, in our, in our time today, membership is taken lightly. True. But I want you to know membership is important. It's, it's vital. Yes. Because what you're doing is you're, you're stating that I no longer want to freelance. Yes. I no longer want to drift. But right. the Holy Spirit is touching my heart to plug in somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. That I can see my gifts come forward and my abilities come forward. And I can plug in to doing what God's calling me to do. Yeah. And, and the only thing about that is, is that we ask that we try to walk in obedience. How many of you know nobody's, no, anybody in here perfect? No. These young people aren't going to be, pro listen, I'm 63 years old and some of these young people at times have more on the ball than I do. <laughs> and so we need to be careful because we understand, don't we, that we're all here. It's, it's um, going from immaturity to maturity. 
Somewhere in that path, all of us are. Right. Nobody's over here. Right. Did you hear me? Right. I know some of us feel we're mature. Okay? But, but we know there's a lot of times when right. we're not. Yes. Right. So nobody's over here at this end. Everybody is from here on the way. How many of you know it's a journey? And so when somebody comes and presents themselves for membership or when somebody comes and they want to serve in an area or when somebody comes and they want to be a part of uh, ministry here, we're, we're not looking for people that are perfect. We're looking for people who will submit themselves and be obedient as much as lies within them to the things of God and will submit them to the covering, the leadership that God's placed them in. These guys here this morning, they're making a commitment before God and all of you that they are submitting themselves to the eldership of this church to help them, to guide them, to lead them. And when they fall short, when they fail, guess what Bethesda doesn't do? We don't kick them while they're down. We wrap our arms around them and we love them and encourage them. And we say to them, come on, you can do this. I would have given anything if that would have been my early years in uh, Christianity. But I want to tell you what, my early years in Christianity, a lot of it was when you had a struggle, they beat you half to death. Amen? Now, they use the word, but how many of you know you can use the word as a hammer instead of a tool to help us to sharpen? And so that's not what we're about. But these young people that went through the class, they all signed up on their free will. Nobody twisted their arm or forced them. And they also signed up for the gifts class. And so um, they they are on the ball trying to fulfill what it is God's doing in their lives. And I thank God for them. One of the things that you guys are committing to, if you don't mind, just turn this way and face me for a minute. Some of the things that you guys are committing to is that you will be a functioning church member. Now, all of you, even before membership, have been functioning. You're in children's church. You're helping out in youth stuff. You're, you're doing different things. Some of you work in the back in the booth. Some of you are preparing to be a part of the worship team. I mean, you guys are are already functioning, but sometimes we start out good and we find ourselves drifting and we're there to help you to continue to be a functioning member in all you do, that you would encourage others to do the same. One of the other things that you're committing to do is you want to be a unifying church member. You do not want to be a church member that's out here causing division and strife within the body of Christ. Did you hear me? Are all you listening to this too? We are unifying. In other words, we want to do everything we can to unify, not to divide. If you're sowing strife, then you're a carnal Christian. If you're sowing strife, then you're probably a prodigal. If you're sowing strife, you're not being obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So you want to be a a unifying church member. And then another thing is, I'll not let my church be about my preferences and my desire. You young people will have different preferences than some of us older people. I had different preferences than my grandparents. You'll have different preferences than us. And all I ask out of you is to be patient and be kind to us older people. Not old people, older. (laughs) Another thing that we want to commend you in and and for you to do is I will pray for my church leaders. We We as elders of this church are far from perfect. We will fail you. And others at some point. We will fall short at some point. Your parents fall short at some point. But what we ask for you to do, instead of becoming rebellious, or instead of um, uh, losing confidence, or or not wanting to um, do the things that you should do, we ask that you would pray for us. Pray for us. The more you pray for us, the less mistakes we'll make amen pray for us encourage lift us up 
Don't give the am enemy any ammo out of your mouth. Huh? Don't give the enemy. You and Katie are talking one day, Olivia, and you're sitting there, and you're, you're saying something about me. Of course you're not going to. I, this is hypothetical, of course. But you're mouthing something that I said or did or you didn't understand, and you're tearing me down. You know who's listening to that? Not just you two, the enemy. And the enemy tries then to take those things and use those as attacks. And so what you want to do, though, instead of that, if you don't understand something or something happens, you need to, one, go to that person. But, if, but, but before that, you need to pray for that person. Lift that person up and encourage them. Another thing that you'll commit to is I'll, I will lead my family to be healthy church members. One of these days, Lord tarries, you guys will have a family. Be a light and an example to them. Show them how you should walk out your faith. I want you to know your family, even those that you're in now in your homes, they will see and know whether or not God's doing a work in you. Right. Help lead that family. Be an example in your actions and your conduct of what true Christians ought to be, what members of Bethesda ought to be. And understand this, not just are you doing that with your family, you represent Bethesda, you represent the kingdom of God when you're out here in your everyday life during the week. And last thing is, but not least, I want you to do this. Treasure church membership as a gift. Yeah, Treasure it. It's a gift because it's not something that you're just entitled to. It's a gift to know the Holy Spirit is planting you somewhere to where you will find a place to bloom and blossom in what it is that God wants you to do. Yeah. Amen? Amen? And so I commend you today for all that you're doing and uh, what you're going to be doing for God, and uh, commission you to go forth in the name of Jesus and to fulfill whatever destinies that God has for you. And we want to be there as the leadership and church to help you. Amen? Okay, back up a few steps. I'm going to do this collectively, not as individuals. Is that okay with you guys? You guys don't mind me? You can say, we collectively did it. All right? I want you to think about this right here because there's going to come a time when some beliefs may come in conflict with other people, organizations, things of that nature. And what I'm going to give you a covenant on today and what you're going to commit to is you're not committing, you're not committing to be obedient to everything, every whim and stuff that's out here. You're committing most importantly to making sure that what you believe and what you receive and what you get a hold of is from the book. There is no greater authority than right here that I'm holding in my hand. And I'm not talking about a version. I'm talking about the Bible. And so when you have a question and you need to find out, it doesn't mean you can't seek counsel. You do that. That's why. But you can always find the answers in the book. Sometimes, sometimes, People are going to have to tell you, well, I don't have an answer, but I'll help you find one. But know this, the truth is the truth, and it's all in this book. And so when you rightly divide the truth, you can stand on what it says. Study, study, I'm commending you, study, study, to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen? Okay. At the end of what I say to you, your answer is, by God's grace, I will. Because, listen, I will do nothing in and of myself. And so I need the grace of God in everything that I do. And so when, when, when I finish this, your response to us, out loud, you that are more timid, out loud, by God's grace, I will. Okay? All right, listen up. Will you sincerely promise... In the presence of God and all of these witnesses, that you will accept this Bible as the Word of God. Believe and practice its teaching, the New Testament as your rule of faith, government, and discipline, and walk in the light of it to the best of your knowledge and ability. Amen. Amen. Love you, brother. Love you, sister. Love you. Love you.
We'll be having meet and greet in a minute, and all of you can go around and shake hands with them, hug them, let them know you're thankful that they're here and they're a part of Bethesda. And I want to tell you what, they are a part of Bethesda full-fledged. Did you hear what I said? They're not junior members. Hello? Amen. We don't have no... Now, they may not be as experienced as you, and they may not be as mature as you, but that's what we're going to help them to become, right? But they're members of the church, and they're due our respect. And we want to make sure we do that. Don't treat them. Don't despise their youth. Now, youth, don't give anybody a reason to despise your youth. Huh? How many of you know? Sometimes, I, I tell you what, sometimes I was my worst enemy. I caused myself so much trouble. Don't, don't let anybody despise your youth. Don't do anything that would cause them to do it. But, but listen, adults, don't treat them like they're lesser. Don't speak down to them. Don't speak at them. Embrace them. Amen? Amen. Okay, well, let's uh, cover some announcements here. Uh, September 16th, it's the State Family Fest. It's at Camp Nakayo. It's a day of fun and fellowship. So the day begins at 9 a.m. and tournaments and things like that and all that other stuff will begin at 10. On September 17th, um, we will be having another Bethesda informational class at 4 p.m. back here in the fellowship hall. Come out and learn what Bethesda is about. You can sign up if you're not a member and you haven't taken that class, but you want to know more about Bethesda, sign up for that class. September 23rd, the women are having a pancake breakfast to raise funds for our women's retreat. 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. I see on here pancakes, sausage, bacon, and I, 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 it's dangerous for people to put this on there because it says, etc., I'm thinking like the et cetera should be like biscuits and gravy, pan, uh, uh, eggs, uh, casseroles. I know somebody that can make a really good breakfast casserole. So I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm not a part of the women's ministry. But, you know, I, I, I'm just throwing that out there. September the uh, 29th. There's a men's camp outing. Men, the information is in the bulletin about all that. Nice little block of information there. And so there is a time for you right now to commit yourself. Don't wait. Don't wait till the last minute to make up your mind. Men, come out for some men's fellowship. Let's have a good turnout for that. And you can find out more information for the men's team, but also information that you want is in the bulletin. On September the 30th, we have a a camp roar, a day camp takes place, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. for ages 5 through 6, $50 registration fee, and there'll be no no same-day registration. So please register by September the 16th to reserve your child's spot. September 25th, 5.30 p.m., Feeding America. Come out and fellowship and help our community in the process, 300 Peterson Drive. October the 7th is the Oasis Retreat. That's for... Older adults still in service. Older adults still in service. 50 plus years. It's one day event um, at the Camp Nakayo. And you can contact Karen Smith if you want to know any more about that. Or our office or the church office. Okay, praise the Lord. Now it's time for us to do what we like to do around here. And that's time for meet and greet. Everybody rise up, fist bump, high five, hug somebody. Let them know you're glad they're here.
worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
fill me up, God, with your love so I can reach out to others that are around me, showing them the love, being a witness and a testimony to who you are and what you're doing, a light to those that are around me. Too many times people who profess to be Christians have really been a reproach to the kingdom of God. They have turned people off or away from the life of Christ by their own lifestyle and their own actions. How they live and how they believe has caused some people to look on and say, if that's what it is, then I don't want anything to do with it. The only ones that know whether or not that's me or not are you is us and God. What are we speaking with our life? First and foremost, to our spouses or our families, to our children. What are we speaking to them? And then when we walk out of that house to our neighbors, what are we saying to our neighbors about who we are? But not just about who we are, but who we belong to. Even people that didn't personally know the disciples knew by their look, their actions, and their conduct that they were a part of his group. Peter had to go to an extreme in order to get them to leave him alone as Jesus was being taken to court. Three times Peter denied Christ. All three times they were telling him, you look like him. You dress like him. You talk like him. Until Peter said, I'll show you. And he went away cursing. People should know who we belong to. They should not have to question who our king is. They should not have to question who governs us. Who rules our lives. Those that are around us. I can have a moment. Come on. All of us have a bad day. All of us can find ourselves to the right or the left, giving too much space to the flesh. But Sarita knows whether I belong to God or not. Hello? My kids know whether... You can sit down. You don't stand up. Sorry. Thank you for that respect, but my kids know who I belong to. You and I'm not afraid for you to go ask them. Don't ask them if I was perfect. They'll they'll have to tell you no. I mean, they'll tell you yes, but they don't mean it. But they know. If, we, that, if we're a part of a church, eventually the church knows. Hello? Eventually the church knows. God is calling us. God is calling us to have a life of obedience that brings forth fruit. He wants us to have a fruitful life. But I want to tell you something. That if you're not obedient to the things of God, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. If we're not obedient to the things of God, then I want you to know something. We will not bear fruit. We will not have abundance. When we think about Discipleship. He said in Luke 9, 23, they don't have that scripture back there, but Luke 9, 23 says, if you're going to be my disciples, if you're going to follow me, if you're going to come after me, you have to deny yourself. It can't be your way anymore. You see, the reason why a lot of people aren't disciples of Christ, they want it their way. He said, if you're going to follow after me, if you're going to come after me, you have to deny yourself. You have to take up your cross. 
And you have to follow me daily. And, and when, we, when we deny ourselves, it means we're trying to die to self. Because you all know, and I've said it here many times, we are our worst enemies. The, the one that I am fighting the most, the one that I'm fighting the most is me, myself, and I. The unholy truth. I'm not fighting my wife. I'm not fighting my children. I'm not fighting my neighbors or who I work with or the boss or... Uh, uh, the one who uh, is responsible to help me. I'm not fighting them. I'm fighting me. If you could ever realize that, when you look at the mi- in the mirror, you're beholding not everybody around you. You're beholding you. And when you take a look into the perfect law of liberty, you discover, when you look into the Word of God, you discover, if you're honest with yourself, you discover what kind of disciple you are. Deny self. Denying self does not happen through outward works. You can't mold yourself enough to be his disciple. Did you hear me? You can't do enough. You know, I have people all the time tell me, what do I need to do? Well, the only thing you need to do is surrender and submit. To lay down your life. To Jesus Christ. And then it doesn't, it's no longer a question. Why? Because you automatically, because of your in, intimacy and relationship with Christ, you want to do what he says. And when you don't do it, you're broken. You know, it's not flippant. It's not, it's not, oh well. You're broken. Because you know that you're not being what he wants you to be. You let self get back up on its feet. I I tell you what, I want to keep self knocked down. Anybody in here want to keep self knocked down? I want to keep self knocked down. I want to keep self dead. I want to keep myself dying daily to to, to, to the will and the ways that I want to do. And I want to rise up in the newness of life and walk in the spirit to be what... He wants me to be. It's not about what I like or what I want. Now, you know what? People get ticked off and mad because of sometimes the things we tell them. But it's, it's really, it's got all to do with, do you want to be a nominal, lukewarm, mediocre, carnal Christian? Do you want to be one of the five foolish virgins? Do you know the five foolish virgins, they all thought they were all right? They were all waiting for the same thing, weren't they? They were all hoping that one day they were going to see the bridegroom, right? And they were all looking spiritual. They were dancing and celebrating and having fun and going about their day. Right? Well, is that what you want to be? Because, because when you think of obedience to God, then, then I want you to know, when you are, if you're really obedient to God, you can't be mediocre. It, those two things don't fit together. Oh, pastor, I'm obedient. I'm obedient to the Lord. Well, okay, well, why is your life so mediocre? Why are you lukewarm? Why are you tepid? Why are you living this other lifestyle here when you don't think anybody else... Do you know what? Listen, I want to tell you something. If you don't think people see you out there and some of the things you do, you're a fool. <laughs> do you know church people pass by people all the time and they see them doing things and they're trying to sneak? And I'm not saying church people are being inve- private investigators. <laughs> I think it just happens. Sometimes you think you're the most excluded. You're the, you're the furthest off and nobody could ever possibly see you. And bam, what in the world? Sri and I, one time, we were uh, holding revival meetings and we were traveling. And we had been down in Florida and we were coming back up. And we stopped at a Shoney's in Mississippi, I think it was. Maybe Georgia. I'm not for sure now where it was at. But we stopped. And, and we were young and hadn't been married that long. We didn't have any kids. Sarita didn't know anything about the world. Well, other than she lived in it. She didn't, 
She never had partied. She never had smoked. She never had drank. She never had ran around in bars or with people who do. And, and she didn't know none of that stuff. If I, would have, if I would have let her sniff a bottle cap back then, she would have been intoxicated. And we were in Shoney's, and it was when Shoney's was offering these little kareefs of wine. You could get wine. And I mean, I was joking, but I said to her, I said, hey, you know what we ought to do? We ought to get one of those and let you just taste it. Yeah. And of course, she looked back at me, and she goes, Jerry. I don't know that she said it exactly that way, but... You know, this was early on, and she wasn't near as sassy early on as she is now. But, you know, she said, Jerry, no, we are not going to do that. That is is not right. And I don't care about what it tastes like. I don't want any. And I said, well, I mean, you know, I mean, you've never tasted it. I was saying, no. And we're sitting there, and we've ordered, we're waiting on our food. And out of the corner of my eye, I see this man and, and his son come walking this way. And it looked like they were looking right at us. But I'm thinking, man, I'm in Georgia. They don't nobody know me here. And they walked up to us and they said, hey, are you, you're a minister, right? And I said, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and your name's Westerfield. And yes. And, and you know what? You were, you were in a holy revival meeting at our church. And my son here received the baptism of the Holy Spirit while you were there. I mean, can you imagine if I, me and Sarita would have been going, oh, that's nasty. And, and they would have saw that? I, I want to live a life of obedience to the word of God. And be a light and a testimony to those that are around me. Deny yourself. Don't let yourself get in the way. Don't let yourself direct you. Don't let yourself be the one that guides you. Man, deny yourself. Die to yourself. Let the one who wants to govern you, govern you. Let the governor, the Holy Spirit, direct your life and keep you to the place to where you're still able to say, moment by moment, not my will, but your will be done. Take up your cross, living for others. Following him. The steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. A double-minded man, listen, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Keeping our mind focused on the Lord, following him daily. He who keeps his mind stayed on me, I will keep him in perfect peace. How many of you want that perfect peace? Life of obedience. When we look at discipleship, though, we have some earmarks. Of discipline. How do we be dis- how can we be disciplined disciples? Everybody in here want to be disciplined disciples? Yes. You know, the Bible says a disciple is a disciplined learner. Some people they 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 cannot be disciplined learners. They're forever going through the motions, but they've really not learned. God says a disciple of mine is a disciplined learner. Learner, somebody who is consistently pressing into the things of God, into intimacy, into the word. If you don't have the word, you have no discipline. But when you look at earmarks of discipline, one of the earmarks of discipline is obedience. One of the earmarks of discipline is diligence. A disciple will be a diligent disciple. A disciple will be somebody who is purposeful at what God's wanting them to do and be. They're not sitting around all the time going, but, 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 I'd like to, but. A disciple finds a way to go deep. A disciple finds a way to get a hold of not just the milk, because you need the milk first, but the meat. A true disciple will not be happy on just milk. A true disciple that's growing will be someone that down the road, man, pretty soon you're, I'm thinking about my, my daughter yesterday, we were eating lunch and, and, and they're trying to make sure they keep their foster uh, son, um, um, happy because he's just little yet. And, and he, he looks like the Michelin, uh, uh, tire man. He's so big and they're trying to hold on. And the kid, when he doesn't have his mouth full, when he's at the table, he screams. 
And so they're popping these little snacks into him. He's grabbing a hand, fistfuls of them and putting them in his mouth. And I, I said, well, no wonder he screams. Look what you're feeding the kid. Oh, these are really good, Dad. These are good. Even Reagan liked these. I reach over and get one of those things, and it's like, Puh. you've got to be kidding me. That's nasty. I'd scream, too, if I was him. But, you know, that kid cannot eat meat right now. But I'm going to tell you what, sooner or later, he's going to get tired of the stuff he's eating. He's going to be wanting some more than just these snacks or something that's soft. He's getting some teeth in his mouth. He's going to want some chicken. He's going to want some steak. He's going to want some meat. Well, every Christian that's been born again, they, they thrive on the milk. They really get into the milk. They want a good foundation. They want people to speak in their lives. But sooner or later, you've got to move on to the meat. Diligence, pursuing, going after the things of God. And then last, an earmark of discipline is productivity. A disciple that's being obedient to the Lord that is a true disciple of Christ produces. Did you hear me? If you're not producing, then you're not his disciple. Do you know that every Christian that's born again, just because you're born again doesn't mean you're a disciple? Did you hear me? We all think discipleship and Christianity uh, is synonymous, but it's not. A person that is a disciple chooses to be. Just like a person that loves should choose to love, not, not, not the other way around, not because of deeds or what happens. You choose to love people. A disciple has to choose, a, a Christian has to choose to be a disciple. You can be a disciple or you can be somebody that's just on the fringes. Some people think that just because they were raised in church, they are a disciple. Some people think that just because they were in a family of people who served in the church, they are disciples. Some people think that just because their parents were ministers in the church and the gospel, that they're disciples. But I'm going to tell you what, a true disciple of Christ is somebody who chooses to be and goes after it. They're diligent, they're obedient, and then because of that, they produce. Because a true disciple knows how to be obedient, a person who knows how to obey and honor commitment and loyalty. You can have a lot of people, how many of you you got a lot of people that talk about faithfulness, commitment, covenant, hello? Do you know what, you know what, but... Faithfulness, if you say you believe in faithfulness, it shows up. People look at you and say, oh yeah, they're faithful. That's what I want people to say when when I pass from this life and they're doing my celebration of life. If Jesus doesn't come and let me fly and I pass away, I want you to know what, what I want coming off of people's mouth more than anything is he was faithful. He was faithful. Commitment. Commitment. You, you know when somebody's committed. Man, sometimes when, they're, when people are committed, they sacrifice. Hello? And not trying to build them up, but, uh, you know, we had a wedding this weekend. Sean and Michaela were part of the wedding party, and Michaela was the maid of honor, and Sean was one of the bride's groom. It was his sister getting married. But you know what they did? They, because we needed it, because we had so many people missing, they went there, but then they drove home and got home at 2.45 this morning so they could be here this morning. I want to tell you what. That's commitment. Some people say they're covenant people. How many of you have heard people say that? Man, we need to be people that are covenant people. I've had people tell me, Pastor, nobody knows what covenant is anymore. They don't preach covenant anymore. They don't teach covenant anymore. I'm so glad when I came into this church, I heard you talking about covenant. And they talk about covenant. You know what covenant means? Covenant means no matter what goes on, I give up the right to quit. No matter what that woman does, no matter what she does, I have committed to her till death do us part. You say, oh, you say that, but if she did that, no, it doesn't matter. God forbid that she would do anything that would cause me any pause, which she never has. But it doesn't matter what she's done. My first role as a believer is forgiveness and to love her and to stick by her because that's what covenant is. Covenant is I will not quit. You're stuck. (laughs) That's really what covenant is. 
You come to a church. You take a covenant. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. Sickness and health. I'm going to be a part of this church, even with its warts and blemishes. I'm going to tell you what, we got some warts. I don't mean people, but I mean we got some warts. Bethesda's got some blemishes. We're not perfect. But I want to tell you something. If you make a covenant with Bethesda, Bethesda and then you have turned around and you break that covenant because of something doesn't work out exactly for you, you're fulfilling what Paul said in 2 Timothy 3 when he said, In the last days, perilous time will come because people will be covenant breakers. Come on. It's easy to talk about covenant, but it's a lot harder to live it. The elders of this church want you to know we will not quit on you. You might leave us, but we won't leave you. We're going to pray for you, love you, tell you the truth, make you mad, even offend you at times. Because we love you. Obedience walks it out because we, we know this. We walk it out because, one, we love the Lord. Isn't that what motivates you? That you love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? That you, you love God with everything that's in you? And so because of that, you're willing to sacrifice? You're willing to labor? You're willing to give it all up for Him? Man, the disciples gave it all up for Him. They left everything. Before they even had a revelation of exactly who He was. You, you, you know that when Jesus went to them and said, hey, 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 drop your nets, come and follow me. Natalie, come and follow me. Well, I can tell Natalie right now, Natalie, you need to follow Jesus. And Natalie says, well, I know that Jesus is the Lord. I know that he's the anointed one. I know that Jesus is the son of God. It makes it a little easier for Natalie to drop everything and follow Jesus, doesn't it? But I want you to know when Jesus came to them, to his disciples and said, hey, drop your nets, come and follow me. They did not have a revelation yet of who he really was. His words touched them. It, 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 it ministered to them. Something got a hold of them and they dropped their nets and followed him. But man, it wasn't until later on when Jesus puts them on the spot and, and, and says, who do men say that I am? Some say you're Jeremiah. Some say you're one of the prophets. Okay, but Sean, you've been with me for three years. Who do you say that I am? You're the Christ. They had a revelation of who Jesus was. But prior to that, they were still wondering. Come on. Even John the Baptist, who was sent as the forerunner of Christ, sent some of his disciples to Jesus, asking Jesus, John is getting ready to lose his head. He wants to know, are you the one or should we look for another? But listen, when you have a revelation of who Jesus Christ is, then you are ready, willing, and you should surrender everything. He who saves his life will lose it. But he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Love your father and your mother. Hello? He tells us that. He also says to Christians, you got to hate your father, hate your mother, hate your brother, hate your sister, and come follow me. Now, again, for the 50,000th time, he's not meaning hate like we think of hate. He's thinking about, I've got to be first. When you're thinking about who is it that I have to obey... Well, I, 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 I'm, I'm going I'm to love my mom and dad, but in the end, i got to obey the word. If what they're saying is contrary to the word. Now, if they're, what they're saying is along with the word, then you want to obey that, right? You want to continue there. But you've got to put Jesus first, and no matter what it is. He even says that it's going to be that way so much that in the end, father is going to be against son. And son is going to be against father. And mother is going to be against daughter. And daughter is going to be against son. Why? Because there's coming a day when we will have to make a choice. Am I going to follow what Sarita says? Or am I going to follow what God says? Am I going to follow what mom says? Or am I going to follow what God says? I'm going to have to make a choice. And it's going to cause conflict. Jesus said, I didn't come here to bring peace. I came to make war. 
war in a sense of making people make a choice of who will you serve. Who will you serve? Choose you this day who you will serve. I want to live a life of obedience. I know that's what you want. A life of obedience brings forth fruit. John 15, 1 through 8, he says, I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. Every branch of me that does not bear fruit takes away. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I spoke to you. You're clean today. Listen. Come on. That, that ought to cause you uh, to like lose, celebrate a little bit. You're clean today. You're clean today. You have been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. He said, you have been made clean by my word. Woo! Come on, you bunch of Baptists. <clears throat> Baptists shout louder than you guys. And, and they're not even for sure that the baptism of the Holy Spirit's for them today. Hello? We, we've settled that issue, haven't we not? We're, we're baptized with the Holy Spirit. Well, I, maybe all of us, but some of us are. So when, when we talk about, I'm free, we are, woo! Hallelujah! I'm clean! Woo! Thank you, Jesus! Man, I know how filthy I was. Maybe you forgot how filthy you were. Maybe you forgot how filthy you still are at times. Well, if you know, if you know that you know that you know there's times when you still ain't so hot. And somebody says, you're clean by the word. Woo! Thank you, God. Devil's been trying to tell me all week, I'm lost and undone and I'm filthy and I'm worthless and I'm not going to get anywhere. I'm not going to make it to heaven. But God, you said I'm clean by the word. You said I've been washed, I've been justified, I've been sanctified, I've been made holy, I am righteous because of you. Man, hallelujah! <laughs> I'll I tell you what, I'm pretty good. <laughs> Abide in me. Listen, you're already clean. If, if they're already clean, why has he got to go on with this? He's going to tell you. Do you know Jesus right here? This is right before he's snatched away. He, he's come out of the upper room with them. He's come out of communion and feet washing and all that. He's told them that his time's coming to an end. And he's traveling with them down the road. He's getting ready to go to... He's heading toward the Garden of Gethsemane. That's what he's doing. He's heading toward it. And he's moving along with them. And he comes to a vineyard. And he says, Aha! Thank you, Father. And he gives them another lesson. He says, if, 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 if you've already experienced my word, then you're clean because of the word I spoke to you. But then he goes on, abide in me. How many of you know, wouldn't you think that if his word had already made you clean, you're abiding? But we know, don't we, that, that Jesus can be in you. And at any given moment, you're not in him. Yo, pastor, I don't believe that. That's false doctrine. Call it what you want to. Let me prove it to you. If you're walking in the flesh, are you at that moment in Jesus? You can't be. If you're walking in the flesh, you're doing the things of the flesh, right? Well, guess what? When I'm walking in Jesus, when I'm walking in the Spirit, when I'm abiding in Him, I can't walk in the flesh. But when I do, I'm not in him. Jesus said, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. 
unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Other words, all you people here are believers. If you're not abiding in Jesus, you will not bring forth fruit. You will not find joy unspeakable and full of glory. You will not be able to discern between good and evil. Come on. If you're out here and you're a nominal Christian or, or maybe you've made a profession of faith, praise the Lord. I'm glad that you're born again. Thank God you're born again. But if you're not abiding, if you're not going after, if you're not pursuing, if you're not in the heat of the moment, in the battle with Jesus Christ, then I'm telling you right now, you are not bearing fruit. You might be bringing forth things that look good due to some of your experience. How many of you know if you're around Christian long enough, you can learn how to act? That's why, oh man, that's why when he talks about the parable of the sower, you know, the father goes out and he sows seed and it falls on some good ground and, and, and it, it begins to speak. What's he sowing? He sowed Jesus Christ into our life. What is the seed? We're the seed. So that we can be a witness to all those that are around us. He's throwing out seed. I, I like this. Gary King um, said this in a message last week that I heard him preaching. He said this. He said, when you go out, he said, God's planting. God's throwing seed out. He's throwing seed into the education realm. He's throwing seed into the entertainment realm. He's throwing seed into the uh, sports realm. He's throwing seed into the business realm. He's throwing seed into the political realm. I want you to know the only thing, the only reason that we're not already right down in the pit of hell is because the Father is sowing Jesus and seed into some of these elements or we would be totally gone. But thank God in our education system, we do have some teachers that still love Jesus. And they're doing what little bit they can due to an ungodly administration and a bunch of woke liberalists who just want to do what they want to do. They're doing everything they can to speak what they can into some of those kids' lives, even though the school system is full of nothing but schmutt and filth and transgenders and homosexuals and people who are preaching their doctrine and their philosophy. These teachers are in the waters up to their necks. While our kids are being polluted in the hallways and in the bathrooms and in other areas, in the sporting arena. Thank God, the coach that got fired because he prayed in the center of the field not long ago. Thank God our Supreme Court had their head screwed on straight and they had reinstated him and he got his back pay. And when he got back, guess what he did? He prayed again. Well, thank God for people like that. But they're few and far between. And our kids are being sacrificed on the arms of Moloch because of the fact that the school systems today are polluted and there's nothing you're going to do about it. Oh, Pastor Jerry, if we rebel and and we have a revolution, we can see... Things turn around. Pastor Jerry, the best days of the United States of America is ahead of us. Listen, you people who, are, who don't know the word and who are acting foolish, you can pray for 24 hours a day and the same results are going to happen. This, this thing's going down. You know why it's going down? Because it's God's plan. Do you know all these things that are happening in the world today? It's not because of happenstance that they're taking place. God's orchestrating it. You say, well, I'll tell you right now, the election in 2020 got stolen. There ain't no way that guy out of his basement got 80 million votes. And I can sit back with you and say, amen. Amen. I believe they robbed it. I believe they stole it. And I believe he's in there just because. But I'm going to tell you what. Don't, don't get puffed up. Don't get thrown no fit. Don't get out here and revolt and rebel. Don't get out here with a picket sign talking about how it got stolen. Just realize this. The reason it got stolen is because God allowed it. There is no authority that's in power that God doesn't ordain. And you know why he's ordained it? You know why they're in power? He's trying to get us to come out of a coma. I, I, I've really come to this conclusion. I've come to this conclusion. Here you go. Ready? And I'm off here. I'm off. I'm running. 
here's what I've come to the conclusion of. We're not asleep. We're not asleep. It's worse than that. We're in a coma. Because when you're asleep, somebody can come along and go, Hey! What? Man, you scared the life out of me. Your wife can say, honey, Sri does this to me all the time. I fall asleep. If I fall asleep in my chair and she's thinking, I, you know what? I want him to go to bed with me. She thinks it's good for her to come over and go, well, she, let me have your leg. Get, come on, you're young. Get your leg up here. I have my leg up and she'll come over and she'll go, Jerry. Ah! Oh. Sarita. Did you have to do that? My age and everything, I, my heart can't take that. Well, I mean, you were, you know, I want you to rest. I was resting. <laughs> Man, I really was resting. But, but, you know, she might have to, you know, Sean stayed at our house. Sean sometimes falls asleep right next to me. Him and I'd be watching some. He was the guy that was going to come to my house, and he was going to restore my buddy to watch sports with. Oh, yeah. And he's, his flesh was willing. Spirit was weak. Because we'd be in the middle of something, watching something. Next thing I know, I hear this. Which he says he doesn't snore. He does. And I'd, I'd, I'd listen to it for a while, you know, not able to hear sometimes the TV. And I'd say to him, Sean! Sean! I'd put my chair seat down, lean forward. Sean! Oh, man, that made it worse. And he'd, he'd go like, what? In the mornings, he worked for Doug, Pastor Doug Gibson. In the mornings, I'd hear his alarm. Mank, 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 mank. Fifteen minutes later. Three minutes later. Mank, mank, mank. I mean, that guy hit umpteen alarms. And then once him and Kayla got together, she had to call in to make sure he was up. Yeah. He w- but he was sleeping. He could be woken up. But I'll tell you what you cannot do in the natural. When somebody's in a coma, you cannot wake them up. You can sound an alarm. You can let the buzzer go off. You can, you can yell it from the housetops. You can even inject them with medicine, right, Kimberly? And if, they're not, if, they're, if that's not going to get them up, they're in a coma, they're in a coma. You can induce somebody in a coma, but you can't just on your own get them out. And I'm going to tell you what right now. Man, we have heard it around here. We have sounded an alarm. We've preached it. We screamed it from the rooftops. We're doing the things that God's trying to get us to do. And people are still looking at us all starry-eyed like, what are you talking about? Listen, I'll tell you what I'm talking about. We are in a battle of the end times that we're getting ready to face. And if we are not going to walk in obedience, we will not fulfill what God is going to have us to fulfill. Jesus said, abide in me. Abide in me, and I in him. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. If you abide in him, he abides in you, you bear much fruit. If you're not bearing fruit, you're not abiding in him. If anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and withered. And they gather, return them, and throw them in the fire and the burn. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. You will be my disciples. Listen, if you don't abide in me, they're going to come and they're going to gather you up. And they're going to cast you in the fire. All of us preachers in our lifetime have preached. They just cast all them into hell. Listen, I'm going to tell you what. This is what I believe. This is what I believe. When he talks about people that are not abiding in him he's talking about the church hello he's not talking about the world he's talking about the church they're not abiding in him they're not awake they're not paying attention they're not abiding in him he he has he has those how many of you know that when the tribulation time starts it's going to be the worst persecution that's ever been on this earth we have right now, there is a spirit of the Antichrist, and I'm getting into more I want to, but still, just for a thing, we have a spirit of the Antichrist that's been operating since the early church. Soon, though, we're going to have the physical Antichrist. 
That's not a spirit. It's going to be someone, a person. And when that person, that Antichrist, comes into power, he's going to have his way with doing everything he can to kill and destroy the church. There are some that's going to escape that because they are making themselves ready now. But some of us are going to still be here to go through the worst persecution ever on the face of the earth. The Bible says it's like none that has ever been. Now, can you imagine that? Can you look at, can you look at the scriptures and see all that person? You can't get, listen, you can't get much worse than filet of life knives. You can't get much worse than being fed to lions. You can't get much worse than being crucified upside down on a, on a cross. You can't get much worse than being hung from the post and set on fire to be, to be light post at the, at the walkways. You can't get much worse than what took place in the early church. He's not talking about the magnitude of the kind of persecution we're going to endure. He's talking about the global aspect of the persecution. He's coming after the whole church. Because the church did not make themselves ready. So because we were not in him, he's going to have them gather us up and we're going to be thrown into the fire of persecution. Come on. That don't sound too good. That's, not, that's, that's hard to say an amen to, isn't it? If you abide in me, my words abide in you, you will ask what you will. Ask what you desire. What is my desire? God, I want to be more like you. What is my desire? God, I want you to separate me from this flesh. God, what is my desire? I want to be holy after you, Lord. You know, we look at that word, if we are abiding in Jesus, you know, this is the, this is the wealth and, and health preachers. If you abide in Jesus and Jesus abides in you, you can ask whatever you desire and he'll give it to you. Oh, God, I want that $100,000 truck. Oh, God, give me my desires. I, I, I want that big, fine, fancy home. God, you see where they're at? They're not abiding in him. If that's what's on your mind today, to get bigger and better, you're not abiding in him. Because if you're abiding in him, he blesses you. Yes, he gives you some of those things. But if you're abiding in him, what your desire is, God, crucify me. Let me die to self. Psalms chapter 1, 1 through 3 says this. He says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he doth meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he shall do shall prosper. Woo! Man, do you hear that? But what kind of person is he talking about? Just you coming down an aisle and giving your heart to the Lord doesn't get you that. He's talking about somebody who's blessed. How are they blessed? They're blessed by obedience. How are they blessed? They're blessed by meditating on the Lord 24-7. They're blessed because they're in love with the Word. In your Word, God, I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. That person that he's talking about there is someone who has put their hand to the plow and they're not looking back. They're pressing toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Is anybody hearing me? The law of the Lord is a delight to this person. James 1... 25 says this, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in in it is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. Did you, are you, is that up there? Can you see it? Did you see what it said there? But he... Or you could say, whosoever looks into the perfect law 
of liberty and then continues in it? Oh, yes, Lord. Look at it. Look at it. Look at it. And, and is not forgetful hearer. Go home today. Some of you, some of you are going to go home today and somebody's going to ask you before the night's over, what did the pastor preach on? Well, I don't know. I think it's the same thing you've been preaching on since you've been here. 2010. <laughs> well, what was it? Uh, well, uh, something, I don't know. Something about obedience. That's why I love, that's why I love you. That's, that, right there is one of my disciples. Did you hear what he said? Well, he needs to preach it again. Don't be, a, don't be a forgetful hearer. You know how you don't, you don't become a, a forgetful hearer? The next little stanza there. But a doer. Man, when I hear something, if I do it, I don't forget it. But if I hear something and put it on a shelf and put it off and don't walk in it, then I forget what it's saying to me. But man, if I'm going to be a doer, I'm looking into the perfect law of liberty and I'm saying, God, yes, let me walk this out. Let me live this. Because, not because that's all I want, but because when I do, he says it, doesn't he? The one, this one, this one, this one, who? Who? Person that, a person that looks in the perfect law of liberty continues in it the person that is not a forgetful here the person that is the doer of the work this one will be blessed guess what if you're the opposite of that is if you're not those things you're drying up like toast you don't have no life you don't have no urgency about you you don't have no unction did you hear me Man. Oh. Who who moved the time forward? <laughs> okay. Listen. We are in a dilemma. The church is in a dilemma. We are duped by the media in a lukewarm Christian society. We are duped and willing to remain where we are because of preachers who have no backbone To tell people the truth. Because we want the crowds. Well, let me tell you something. Jesus had the crowds. And he said to them one day, you're going to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And the Bible says many of them did not follow him here. You know know why? Because that don't give you no warm fuzzy. He, he said to them things like this, if they hate me and you're my disciple, they're going to hate you. No, we, we want to walk around with the world loving us. Oh, no, no, no. If you're going to be my disciple and you're going to t- deny yourself, you're going to take up your cross, you're going to follow me, you're going to live for me daily. I'm going to tell you what, they're not, they hated me, they're going to hate you. They want to put me to death, they're going to kill you. Matter of fact, he tells them in the word, in, in Matthew 24, he tells them, one of the signs is, they're going to come and they're going to gather you up and they're going to kill you. That happened, by the way. In 70 AD, Jerusalem Israel was overrun. Jerusalem was overrun and destroyed and was not again in the hands of the Israelites until 1967, eight, something like that. Israel became a nation in 1940 something and 1960, but they weren't what, it wasn't that generation yet because it wasn't until the 60s that Jerusalem actually was partially back in their hands. Jesus said, you're going to be trodden under the foot of men. They're going to put you in prison. How many of you know that every, almost all the disciples were martyred? For what? Because they told people the truth. Even when they didn't like it. 
And in the midst of them, in the midst of them, false prophets arose. I'm going to leave you with this. They said, Master, and I'll talk about this uh, some other time. But they said, Master, tell us what are the signs going to be of your coming, of the end. The end of, he, and, and a lot of p- people say the end of the world, but they were talking about the end of the, he was talking about the end of the age. What, what's going to take place and happen at the end of the age? They ask him, they ask him three questions. I'm not going to get into them today. But in, in, the, in the very first sign that Jesus speaks about, he says, deception. Deception. Now, this, this mediocre lukewarm, religious church still thinks when, it's, when the word deception's there, it's about what the world's going to do to deceive us. How many of you are going to bow down to somebody who tells you to worship at their feet because they're Christ? Anybody in here? Anybody in here going to have the devil tell you, just go ahead and shoot that person, you're going to do it? Go ahead and don't believe the word and you're going to do it. The Bible's not real. It's no good anymore. Now, some people believe that. But we're not, you're not going to believe that, are you? But you know what he's talking about when he's talking about the sign, this, this first sign that you're going to deal with, this sign of deception? He's talking about what's going to happen within the church. He's talking about people that will rise up. They went out from us, but they weren't of us. Come on. They're seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. They are individuals who will compromise the truth. Listen, we we have a watered-down gospel today. We have a watered-down preaching today. We have a watered-down system today. We're all about the crowds. We're all about the convenience. I want you to know the elders aren't here to convenience you. If you don't want to stay past 12 o'clock... You don't have to. But we're not here to convenience you. We're not here to have an hour service. There's plenty of places to have an hour service. We're here to tell you the truth and to preach to you what God's word says. Rightly divided. Trying our best to get us ready. I'm getting ready to leave this world. I'm getting ready to leave this world. But before I can leave it, before I can leave it, he says this, judgment's going to begin at the house of God. I'm the house of God. I'm the temple. Judgment's going to begin at the house of God. God's, God's trying to judge us now. He's trying to purify us now. He's trying to cleanse us now. Judgment's going to begin at the house of God. And man, if judgment begins at the house of God, where are the ungodly and the sinners going to be? He's coming. He's coming. He's threshing his floor. I'm going to tell you what, we're going to be put in the wine press. But when you're put into the wine press, I'm going to tell you what, does that not sound painful to you? Does it, you know, when I think of a wine press, I think of those old fashioned washing machines. Sister Webb, do you remember any of those? Are you old enough to remember the old fashioned washing machine where they cranked them? And you see that, that, that shirt come through there and it comes, it's soaking wet over here in the tub. And when it comes through, it's almost totally dry. Because those rollers have squeezed all of that water out. You know what? We're getting ready to go through, and we're starting to go through now, the wine press. He wants to get out all of the impurities that's still in us so that we can be ready to leave this world. We all have got them. There's nobody here exempt. If you're exempt or you're trying to exempt yourself from having to go through the wine press, I want you to know you're for sure going to be left here to go through the persecution and trial of the tribulation time. Don't 
let your false doctrine and things you've been preached to, I don't care who preached them to you, think that everybody, every Christian is going to escape this tribulation time. No, that tribulation time is to finish off getting the church ready to leave here. Because I'm going to tell you right now, listen, if you think we're ready, you are spiritually blind. You are spiritually asleep if you think we're ready. Well, pastor, I've been born again. Well, I hope that theology of yours works. Because when you got born again, he said, now make yourself ready. If I was ready at born again, I wouldn't be standing here today some 40-some years later still fighting the fight of faith. I'd just be out of here. But he's trying to get us ready. Where are you going to be? How are you going to do? How are you going to handle it? That's why the Holy Spirit touches us. I'm going to tell you what, everything about us is sold out. Everything you can think of is sold out. And we as Christians have been duped because we have bought into it. We bought into the politics. We actually really believe that they're out for our good. I mean, you've got to be joking me. Republican administration, Democrat administration, it don't matter. Some of them better than others, but it doesn't matter, man. They're all out for themselves. They're all out to do what they want to do. Red, yellow, black, white doesn't make any difference. Brown. No matter who's in there, they got their agenda. Now, we got a governor's race coming up. Oh, I can't even believe in the state of Kentucky that the governor right now has a 10% lead over Cameron. Cameron, a good, godly man, wants to do what's right. And then a governor over here who wouldn't know Jesus if he walked up in front of him. You say, how, do you, how can you say that? How can you say that? Listen, you can't know Jesus if you're for abortion. You can't know Jesus if you're for homosexuals getting married. You can't know Jesus if you think we ought to have transgender bathrooms in our school. That's just the truth. Oh, pastor, you are not getting politics. They'll take away our 501c3. Go get it. Cameron's not perfect either. But I want you to know something. Listen, they're not the ones that's going to save us. Our entertainment society has been has sold out. Come on, goodness. Have you not seen the clips? It's not just, it's just not scary. It's demonic. It's evil. It's evil when they are promoting soul snatching, when they are promoting taking souls from kids, when they're promoting demonology, when they're promoting all that wickedness and evil and perversion and wickedness. It is nothing but pure demonic. And we as Christians go, oh, I just can't wait for it to come out. No, no, no. You're mediocre. You're lukewarm. You're marginal. And you need to repent. That we would realize, wait a minute, man, they've sold out. Thank God for a few of the voices. Last week, Sri and I watched a movie called I Believe. Anybody watch the movie I Believe? Everybody in this house ought to go watch the movie I Believe. I'll tell you one scene because they tell it in the, in the trailer. This, this young boy, young boy, parents aren't Christians. He's going... And he starts hanging out, talks to this pastor, goes to the book thing. He buys comics from this guy. And all of a sudden, he reads a scripture on the church's sign about believing what God will do if you believe. And he gets him a Bible. His dad tells him, don't get a Bible. But he gets one, sneaks one. He's, got a, he's dishonoring his parents. He's got a Bible. That's right. He's got a Bible. And he goes to this church one day to visit his pastor. And he talks to the pastor. It's this little kid. 
And right before he got there, a guy from, was in the military, had been there before him in a wheelchair who had lost his leg right, uh, uh, right below or right at the knee, knee. And the guy's talking to the pastor because his life is messed up. I mean, come on. His, his wife is sad and miserable because he's like he is and hurt. And, and all these things are going on. This and the guy leaves. And as the guy leaves... The young boy comes in, talks to the pastor for a few minutes, goes out, and he finds the guy in the wheelchair. And he, and he says to this guy in the wheelchair, he said, um, the Lord's going to hear you, your prayer. He's going to answer your prayer, and he's going to do it. And the boy just turns around and walks off. Little nerdy looking boy, he got big old giant glasses, you know. And this guy's sitting in the wheelchair, and, and the guy prays a prayer. Lord, I want my wife to be happy. And the guy starts screaming. It's murdered! It's murdered! It's murdered! And his leg grows back. Church people all over watching that movie. Well, that was, that's all back in the past. Church people, Christians, oh, well, you know, that stuff just don't happen anymore. No, you know what? It doesn't happen anymore. You know why? We don't believe. But God wants it to happen. Thank God, thank God there's some people in the entertainment business that still love Jesus and are trying to put out things that can minister to you. But you can't depend on them because they're filthy, they're nasty, they're vulgar, they're evil. They're out to destroy. They're out to kill. They're out to steal. They don't, they have an agenda. The agenda is to turn you completely away from anything that's decent. Where are you at today, though? What do you see in your own life? What do you feel in your heart? What are you pursuing after? Are you just kind of riding it out? Well, I'm just going to ride it out, Pastor Jerry. I'm just going to ride it out. I've been around a long time. I'm just going to ride it out to the end. I'm going to tell you what, you ain't going to ride it out to the end if you have that attitude. You're going to be running for your life here real shortly. Hello? Do you know, do you know the age of man is 6,000 years? From Jesus until the child of promise was 2,000 years, from the child of promise to Jesus was 2,000 years, and from Jesus until now, it's been almost 2,000 years. And then guess what happens? Then there is the seventh thousand, which is the millennial reign, the thousand years of peace. Six thousand years. So from Adam to, to I, Isaac, two thousand years. From Isaac to Jesus, two thousand years. From Jesus, let's see, Jesus was born. He was 31 and a half when he left here, 33. Some people debate that. If you take 2,000 years from his birth, then we're right at the period right now. If you take it from when he left here, it's 2,030 some. And guess what we have in the midst of all that in there? We have the tribulation times. Three and a half years of tribulation, three and a half years of God's wrath. Folks, listen. I, that's my opinion. That's what I think. I believe we are right now at the threshold of the tribulation times. We are right now in what we have preached about. And what we have in the church, what does this church say? Oh, no, Pastor Jerry, that's not true. We're going to be here forever. Oh, no, Pastor Jerry, I've heard that preach since I was a little kid. Oh, no, Pastor Jerry, we ought not be doing that. We ought to preach about love. Listen, I am preaching about love. I'm loving you enough to warn you, to get your act together, to get your focus on Jesus. I love you enough to tell you, don't sit idle. Don't sit back. Don't sit on your laurels. I'm sitting around here loving you enough to tell you, don't worry about what you heard preached all your life. Right now, we are hearing worldwide events. These signs that Jesus talked about weren't regional. They were universal. They're happening right now and have happened. Where are you at? You're planning on your retirement. You're planning on this long future. Where are you at? One of these days, Jesus is going to take us into a place to where none of that's going to be possible because when the Antichrist 
We're, we're, we're right now, listen, we are right now moments away from a cashless society. That's right. We're moments away. We already have it going on. Already some of the major banks are already gearing up and they're already locked down. We're already having businesses not accept cash. We're moments away from a cashless society. It's going to be your little card or it's going to be digital currency or it's going to be something of that nature. We are moments away from fulfillment of the scripture. And we've got preachers and pulpits that are saying, that's not true. There's no such thing as a cashless society. Just wake up and watch. We are moments away from a one world government. Five countries have got together who no longer use the dollar as their currency. Forty more countries have notified them. We want to get on board. Why are they doing that? They're going to do and put the last nails in the coffin of taking the United States of America out of the picture. As long as we're in the picture, God's plan will not come to pass because we will fight. But we're getting ready to face a time when this one world government's going to come into place. Do you know what they're doing right now? Do you know what they're doing right now? They, you ever found it funny? I, I always find this funny. First time in my lifetime, first time in my lifetime that the whole time a guy was president, they were after him and hated his guts. Tried to destroy him. And ever since he's been out, they haven't stopped. But do you know what? They're after him, right? They want to put him in jail and they may succeed. But you know what they're really after? They're after you and I to act stupid. I, I, I listened to a little video clip this week about how people are screaming for a new revolution. We need to have a new revolution. And you know what? That's what their plan is. They want us to have a revolution. Did you know that? They want all these people, they call these MAGA fanatics, they want them to rise up. They want the church to rise up because this is what this guy said. They're kicking the dog. They're kicking the dog. They're kicking the dog and kicking the dog until they can get the dog to respond and then they'll shoot it. Listen. They're gouging us. They're gouging us. And we want to get in their face. That We're trying to get in there. We're trying to pick at them. We're trying to boycott them. We're getting in their face. But that's not what God's calling us to do. God's calling us to be a light to the world. A city set on a hill. Letting everyone know, hey, wait a minute. This is not your destiny. Jesus, his kingdom is. Let's stand. Remember this, when Jesus came, the people that were out there, the Hellenists, were looking for a revolution. They were looking for Jesus. They were looking for a Messiah, but they were looking for a conqueror. They were looking for somebody to come in and set things straight and to defeat um, the Romans and to put down the Jewish religion. And Jesus to set up his kingdom. They were looking for Jesus. They, you would think they were a bunch of good old guys. But when Jesus came, guess what he didn't do? He didn't get on board with them. He, he went around doing good. To some of the people they hated, Jesus did good. Jesus didn't go into their synagogues and, and, and try to overturn all their stuff. He, just, he went into the synagogues and what did he do? He told them the truth. They were mad at him and hated him because of the truth, not because he had the disciples go in and turn, turn, uh, tear apart everything, even though there was one time when he did turn the tables over because they were making his house a den of thieves. Jesus came here. He came here to start a revolution, but a revolution in my heart. A revolution in who we're going to turn to and go to and look to. No, nothing is going to save you in this world, save Jesus Christ. Where are you at today? This altar is always open. They're going to play. This altar is always open. No matter where you're at, no matter what you're in, no matter how you're thinking right now, Jesus is the answer, folks. 
No matter how long you've been here, no matter how little you've been here, no matter how long you've been alive, no matter how short your life's been, Jesus is here for you. It really is about a choice. It really is today about choice. Choose you this day who you will serve. Who am I going to lay my life down to? Who am I going to give it all up to? Who am I going to surrender to? That's the, that's the real choice. Who am I going to let be the Lord of my life? Am I going to let Lord Jerry be the Lord? Am I going to let Lord Church be the Lord? Or am I going to let Lord Jesus be the King and the Lord of my life? That's what it's come down to right now. It's come down to a choice. Choose you this day. Who am I going to follow? Who am I going to look to? Who am I going to surrender to? This morning as they play, please step out and come. Surrendering it all to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He's our hope. He's our refuge. He's our strength. He's the one that's more than enough right now. In Jesus' name. Yeah. 